Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians. This, uh, keep in mind, Paul, he just wrote a bunch of letters to different assemblies. Different assemblies had different questions, different problems. Excuse me, we're not privy to exactly what the problems were. We don't have the questions that were given. We have the answers. Now, we can figure out what the questions are for the most part. <clears throat> and he gives them some general information, but what he's doing with these letters is attending to situations and questions in a particular assembly. He's not necessarily broad brushing everything he says for everybody. There's different issues in different assemblies. And that's what he's addressing. Now let's look at, this is the second letter he wrote to these people. Um, we went over the first one last week. And it was a little bit longer. And the way these are arranged, these are arranged for the most part by length. The longer the letter is, the, the earlier it is listed in Scripture. <clears throat> so, let's take a look at the, this uh, second letter. It's not very long, really. Just three short chapters. and uh, There's a lot of stuff here, though. The first three verses, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the assembly of the Thessalonians in Elohim our Father and the Master Yeshua Messiah. Grace to you and peace from Elohim the Father and the Master Yeshua Messiah. We ought always to give thanks to Elohim for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faithfulness is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Now, once again, the, the term faithfulness should always be used instead of faith. Uh, the, the Greek word pistis is not a, a passive emotional word like faith is, like confidence. Got confidence in you. Well, that's, I got confidence in Jesus. Well, okay. No, it's, it's faithfulness. We're supposed to have a relationship with the Father and, and with Messiah. Uh, faithfulness is what's called for, which is, which is being true to and obedient to. Yeah. Uh, these assemblies, did, where did they go? Like 50 years ago, we've talked about you did right. her, a group. That time span, were they, were they dispersed? What happened to them? I mean, Islam. Destroyed them? Yeah, Islam destroyed them. See, all that area that is now Islamic used to be Christian. All that area used to be. <clears throat> Verse 4. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the assemblies of Elohim for your perseverance and faithfulness in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. So in the midst of, of persecution, their faithfulness is in following Torah is evident. That's another reason why I say it's, uh, faithfulness is what it's referring to. It's evident. See, faithfulness is what you do. Uh, it's not an emotion. Emotions, emotion, well, with faithfulness is love, which is a, a, greater, uh, a greater emotion than, than where we would put faith. <clears throat> so faithfulness, it was evident, even amongst, uh, amidst persecution. Now, we talked about this last time. Why persecution? Being obedient to the Torah. Why would there be persecution there? Well, they're in a Gentile area, and they're acting like, in their eyes, Jews. Yeah. And the Jews will persecute them because they're Gentiles and they consider them wannabes. But there weren't that many Jews around there in this area. This is mostly a Gentile area. <clears throat> Verse 5, this is a plain indication of Elohim's righteous judgment so that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of Elohim, for which indeed you are suffering. So they're considered worthy of the kingdom of Elohim because they're faithful to his instructions, even through suffering. Verses 6 through 8, For after all, it is only just for Elohim to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when, the mas when Master Yeshua shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know Elohim and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Master Yeshua. 
um, Paul says, Master Yeshua is going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Angels. Keep in mind that that term really means messengers. In flaming fire to deal out retribution to those who do not know him and do not obey the gospel of Yeshua Messiah. What is the gospel of Master Yeshua, as he says? Why would it be any different? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's, that requires obedience. Because what's the first word? Repent. And what does that mean? Turn toward the Torah of the Father and be obedient to it. Turn away from your ways and toward his. <clears throat> Repentance, which is obedience to the Torah of the Father, is necessary. Or else the penalty... His eternal destruction is what he says. Paul knows that the day of Yahweh being described as him coming in fire, dealing out retribution to his enemies, to those who disobey his Torah, that is found in the Tanakh in several places. Uh, and by the way, when you're dealing with prophecy in Paul's letters, and I'll emphasize this later too, when you're dealing with prophecy in Paul's letters, it's not the word of Paul. He is teaching the scriptures. That's all he knows to do. And he, he, has, he has taken out the traditions of, of men, the traditions of the Jews, and <clears throat> the gospel of Yeshua will pertain only to the word of the Father. And that's what he's talking about here. But this uh, coming in retribution to those who don't know Elohim and to those who are not obedient to his Torah, that's in the Tanakh several places. In Isaiah 66, starting in verse 15, for behold, Yahweh will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind. See, that's what he's talking about. He's teaching what's being said here. To render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Well, that's where he got it from. Yeshua shall be real, revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Dealing out retribution. Going back to Isaiah 66, verse 16. For Yahweh will execute judgment by fire and by his sword on all flesh. And those slain by Yahweh will be many. He talks about who they'll be. Those who sanctify and purify themselves to go to the gardens. This is idolatry. Following one in the center. Those who eat swine's flesh, detestable things, and mice shall come to an end altogether, declares Yahweh. Yeah. Fire. Is that literally or just <laughs> wrath in general? <coughs> What? I think that is, I think that is both. I think it's both. Yeah. Yeah, that's purification. I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, th th this is a, a very dangerous passage to take lightly. When he says those who eat swine's flesh, detestable things, and mice shall come to an end altogether, declares Yahweh. They'll be destroyed forever. That's what they call eternal damnation in other parts of Scripture. Now, I know by our logic, that sounds like rather harsh treatment of somebody who eats a ham sandwich. But that's what it says. And I, I don't know how else to put it. Yeah. It's not eating the ham sandwich, it's the disobedience. Yeah, it's disobedience, that's right. That's, what, that's the way the world looks at it though, just for eating a ham sandwich. Uh, yeah, um, okay, uh, I for one am not comfortable saying, but I wouldn't worry about that, okay? <laughs> this seems pretty direct to me. Let's look at Deuteronomy 32, verses uh, 41 through 43. We read, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold in ju on justice, I'll render vengeance on my adversaries and I'll repay those who hate me. I'll make my arrows drunk with blood. My sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the long-haired leaders of the enemy. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he'll avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance on his adversaries and will atone for his land and his people. That, I think, more of it is a description of wrath. I remember looking at Revelation 9 and the long-haired. Yeah. Is that sort of associated? It's sort of the same thing, yes. 
It, it, it has uh, feminine derivatives. Yeah, weakness. That's correct. <clears throat> Ezekiel 38, verses 21 through 23. And I shall call for a sword against him on all my mountains, declares Adonai Yahweh. Every man's sword will be against his brother. And with pestilence and with blood I shall enter into judgment with him, and I shall reign on him and on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. And I shall magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am Yahweh. Let's look at verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians 2. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the master and from the glory of his power. <clears throat> Those who do not obey the gospel of Master Yeshua and don't know Elohim will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. Um, to obey the gospel of Master Yeshua, what does that mean? It means to obey righteousness. Obey righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 2. Look in a different letter that Paul wrote. And he, he talks about this. Starting in verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of Elohim, who will render to every man according to his deeds. He's going to render to everyone according to their deeds, whether they be good or whether they be bad. But how do you tell a good deed from a bad deed and vice versa? I mean, if you're not hurting anybody, it's not a bad deed, is it? Measure it against the Torah. Uh, you know, this, this is the thing. Uh, mankind's not capable of determining what's good and what's bad. Okay? We think we, we can vote on it. Uh, and that determines what's good and what's bad. No, our morality comes from above. If we rely on man's decisions on what's good and what's bad... Uh, bad is going to quickly disappear. And everything will be good. If not good, then okay. And we'll have a uh, great big gray scale. <clears throat> who will render it to every man according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But honor and glory and peace to every man who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there's no partiality with Elohim. For all who have sinned without Torah will also perish without Torah. And all who sinned under Torah will be judged by the Torah. For not the hearers of Torah are just before Elohim, but the doers of the Torah will be justified. Did he say that? I guess he did say that. He did write that, didn't he? Um, I, I, that's what Paul said. I think they take a lot of things of Paul and, and misunderstand them. Some people think that he, he, uh, he, he is encouraging lawlessness, but he's not. Uh, whenever we see that is an apparent uh, statement that he's encouraging lawlessness, what, we're, what we need to do is look at the translation and look at the words that he actually said, and you'll see that that's not the case. Those who do not know Elohim are those who do not obey his commandments. If you don't obey his commandments, you, you have no idea who he is. In Matthew 7, starting at verse 21, we read, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, well, you know, but he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. You know, here's the situation. I know as a, uh, back in the Christian days, if only I knew what his will was for me. You know, not his will in general, but his will for me personally. If only I knew that. I think I need to pray more and find out. Okay, y'all, honestly. Didn't you? Uh-huh. That's not, you, okay, you do not, you do not learn of him and his ways through prayer. Okay? It never says in Scripture to pray for knowledge. That's not where knowledge is. Where is knowledge? That's in his word. That's why he gave it to us. 
Yeah, when I was in college, I wanted to take my calculus book, put it under my pillow, and all that information seep up into my brain at night. That didn't work. <laughs> it's not comfortable. <clears throat> no. Had to crack that book open. Take notes, study, listen, listen. <clears throat> you know, many, he says, many will say to me on that day, Master, Master, did we not prophesy in your name? That's not in the Torah. And in your name cast out demons? That's not in the Torah. In your name perform many miracles? That's not in the Torah. Didn't we do all these things? Yeah, those things I didn't ask you to do. You sure did. Then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. And it doesn't say a name. It doesn't say Patrick. Depart from me, Patrick. You don't even know my name. It says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, whatever your name is. What's your name? Because I don't know you, because whatever your name is. That's what he says. I never knew you. Never heard of you. Your name's not in that book I wrote before the uh, creation of the world. One of the landowners. It wasn't that your name's not there. In 1 John 2, starting at verse 3, by this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Um, you know, John, oh, man, he's, you know, I would have worded this a lot nicer. But he calls someone who says, I've come to know him and I don't keep, but I don't keep his commandments. He said, well, he's just a liar. Period. He's just a liar. And the truth is not in him. He doesn't know the truth. There's no truth there. Uh, yeah, I get it. Yeah, exclamation points on that. Uh, he's a liar. Yep, he probably underlined it, wrote it in capital Greek letters, you know. No such thing. But if there were. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of Elohim has truly been perfected. By this we know that we're in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. If you say you abide in Messiah, then you should walk the same way he walked. Did he keep the Torah of his father? You bet he did. How are you, what are you supposed to do? Keep the Torah of the Father. And what else? Nothing. Nothing's required other than that. That's your, that's your duty. Okay? Walk as he walked. Keep the Torah. Love your neighbor. That's in the Torah. <clears throat> Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you. But an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is a word which you've heard. It's called the Torah. That's the old stuff from way, way, way back. Everybody remember that way back stuff. <clears throat> Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians. Verses 10 through 12. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. To this end also we pray for you always that our Elohim may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the uh, work of faithfulness with power. See that? The work of faithfulness. All right? In order that the name of our Master Yeshua may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our Elohim and the Master Yeshua Messiah. Paul wants Elohim to count them worthy of their calling. You're called, you're chosen. I want you to be worthy. That's what he says. Fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faithfulness with power. The work of faithfulness. Faithfulness involves work, by definition. This will glorify Yeshua Messiah in us. Let's go to the second chapter, verse 1. Now we request you, brethren, with the regard of the coming of our Master Yeshua Messiah and our gathering together to him. Um, Paul is now going to elaborate on what he said in the first letter the Thessalonians were concerned that their loved ones had, who had passed away are going to miss out on being a part of the kingdom. That's what they were worried about. He already told them the dead Messiah, no, they're going to rise first, according to the Tanakh. Now he's going to tell them these, about these things that they said, well, you know, has he already returned? No, he hasn't already returned. There are certain things that have to take place first. Certain things he's going to go over have to take place first. Um, the bad news for them is they did not see these things happen in their lifetime. The good news is they're in our rearview mirror. 
They've already happened. We don't have to wait on anything else to happen. And we're going to go over these things right now. Um, <clears throat> let's look at verse 2. That you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed. Oh, one other thing I want to go over here. Notice how he talks about it's a gathering together. It's a regathering. All right? This is a re... When you talk about the regathering, who are you talking about? Saints. Well, you say the saints. Yeah, but... What was promised in the Tanakh? Regathering of who? Not the, not the Jews in particular. Israel. Israel, thank you. The regathering of Israel. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Israel. Not the church or anything like that. It's the regathering of Israel. Verse 2, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of Yahweh has come. So I think they were deceived by somebody that the day of Yahweh had already come and they missed it. Confusion apparently abounded. Verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Okay, so Paul says the day of Yahweh and this regathering would not occur until several things happen first. The first thing he mentions is the apostasy. Now, it's from the Greek word apostasia. It's a defection from the truth, a falling away, a forsaking. <clears throat> this particular word is only used in this passage and also in Acts 21, verse 21. <clears throat> Let's read that one. And they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake, apostasia, Moses. Forsake Moses. Telling them not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. Well, you know, in this case, the apostasia means forsaking the Torah of Moses. Forsaking the Torah. Well, what do you think it means in his letter to Thessalonians? The same thing. The apostasy, the turning away from the Torah of Moses will happen first. Um, Paul gets all his information from the Tanakh. He said, that's going to happen first. Okay? Where? Where did he get that? That's a good question. Now, Paul knew that things described in Daniel and Ezekiel have not yet taken place, including what he's calling the apostasy, the turning away from the Torah of Moses. The, he's talking about the changing of the times and the law of the, and the Torah. That's in... Uh, Daniel 7, verse 25. And he, this is the little horn, he will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in the Torah. And they'll be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half. So that's what he's talking about. That, and he's the one he's talking about. That little horn hasn't shown up yet. <clears throat> And he's also talking about Daniel 11, verse 31. And forces from him, that's the little horn, from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary for, uh, fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice. And they will set up the abomination of desolation. Okay, uh, and we know what that is. We'll talk about that here shortly. Paul calls him the man of lawlessness. Now that word... Uh, Man, it could, uh, it's, anth it's anthropos. And, and anthro uh, anthropos, anthropos. It can mean king, it can be one, it can mean people. It doesn't necessarily mean man, although it's mostly translated as man. It depends upon its context. Um, in, but he's talking about in Daniel 11, verse 32. And by smooth words, he will turn to godlessness, those who act wickedly toward the covenant but the people who know their Elohim will display strength and action. Uh, Paul also called him the son of destruction, and that's how he's referred to in Daniel 9, verse, uh, oh, the man of lawlessness here. He will intend to make alterations in times and in Torah. <clears throat> As son of destruction, 
we read that on Daniel 9, verse 27, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction. That's Islam. All these are about Islam. Altar times and the Torah, they have their own Sharia law, which is nothing but a, a, a barbaric method of treatment of anyone other than Muslim men. <clears throat> but that's who, and, and Paul doesn't know what Islam is yet, except what he reads in Daniel. They're going to change the Torah. They're going to cause destruction. Uh, they're going to be lawless. That hasn't, he said that hasn't happened yet. Let's go back to that letter. Verse 4 of chapter 2. Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, Okay, he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of work, worship. What does Allah, Allah Akbar mean? God is greater. Allah is greater is what that means. It doesn't mean Allah is great. Allah is greater than your God. Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of Elohim displaying himself as being Elohim. Now, um, keep in mind, Paul is teaching prophetic things that have not yet happened in his day. He is paraphrasing them according to his own understanding. Paul says that this one will oppose and exalt himself above every so-called God and display himself as being Elohim. Look, go back to Daniel again. Daniel 11, verse 36. Then the king will do as he pleases, and he'll exalt and magnify himself above every god, and will speak monstrous things against the god of gods, and he'll prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. See, we're in this day and age now, Islam is going to grow. They're going to conquer. And there's not a darn thing we can do about it. You know why? Because that which is decreed will be done. He, being Islam, will prosper until the indignation is finished. <clears throat> it says he'll take his seat in the temple of Elohim. And how did he word this again? It's right there. Um, so he takes his seat in the temple of Elohim, displaying himself as being Elohim. Oh, now how did he do that? People, this is not... This is not an antichrist that rides a pig into the temple and gets, sits on the Holy of Holies and sacrifices a pig. The antichrist stuff is nonsense. Pure and utter nonsense. That is exactly what the Mosque of Omar is, what Paul is describing right here. It's exactly what that is. <clears throat> we read in Daniel 11, verse 31, Forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice, and they'll set up the abomination of des desolation. That's what that is. See, that's what Paul's trying to describe, but how do you describe it? In his day, he, he, he had the prophecy to deal with, but the prophecy is almost impossible to deal with to predict things. Right, it's, it's, but you see, if you, read the, if you read it here, forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress. See, that's what he's, that's what he's describing. And do away with regular sacrifice, and they'll set up the abomination of desolation. That's what that is. Uh, and there's all kinds of writings uh, that are in there, uh, in that mosque, uh, of dedication and so forth, that God has no son, and that type of thing. In the Lahu Akbar and whatever, if there's a bomb dispensary there, I don't know. Verses 5 and 6, 2 Thessalonians 2. 
Do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. Um, the Father is restraining things from happening. And he's talking about this. What is restraining him now? He says, well, you know what it is. He taught them the book of Daniel is what he did. Which, right now, we've quoted all these things he's been saying, and it's obvious he's getting them all from the book of Daniel so far, right? Well, what's restraining what now would know to be Islam from having come before then? They didn't come until 622 A.D. So hundreds of years after Paul wrote the letters. What is restraining that? Here's the deal. Um, in Daniel... They talk about spiritual entities of entire empires. And uh, look at Daniel 10, verse 13. And in this, in this chapter, Daniel is praying for, for, first of all, he's praying for forgiveness for his people. And he's praying to know what's going to happen, for him to tell him, give me a message. And this angel, messenger comes in two weeks, two weeks later. And uh, he says, hey, I got held up. I got restrained. <clears throat> uh, oh, 21 days, not 14. And he says, in verse 13, he said, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was restraining me for 21 days. And then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I'd been left there with the kings of, uh, with the kings of Persia. See, Persia hadn't arrived yet. And the king of the Persia is coming, and he also talks about the the uh, the kingdom, the king of the prince of Greece was coming. They're the ones that defeated Persia, much later in the game. So this is what he's saying. You know what restrains him now? These things that restrain entire kingdoms in some spiritual entity of some kind, described in Daniel. Those things will happen in the Father's time. You know what restrains him now, so that in his time. He may be revealed. That's in the Father's time. Verse 7, 2 Thessalonians 2. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Lawlessness is at work. Lawlessness is all, has always been in the world. But the lawless one has not come yet in, in their day. He will not come until the one who restrains him is taken out of the way by Elohim. Verse 8, then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the master said will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring an end to the appearance of his coming. Elohim is going to destroy this lawless, lawlessness that's coming, this apostasy, which is Islam at the appearance of his coming. That's what he'll destroy. That's in uh, Daniel 7, verses 10 and 11. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. And I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. I just find it fascinating that Paul taught everything, all these things, from that book of Daniel. Verse 9, that is, the one who's coming is, is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. <clears throat> um, the one coming will have the power and signs and false wonders of Satan. In Daniel 11, verse 36, then the king will do as he pleases. He'll exalt and magnify himself above every uh, god and will speak monstrous things against the god of gods. He'll prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. Daniel 11, verse 39, and he'll take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign god. He'll give great honor to those who acknowledge him, and he'll cause them to rule over the many, and will parcel out land for a price. Which, that's a good description of what goes on in Islamic countries. <clears throat> uh, give great honor to those who acknowledge him. Go to a Muslim country and try to buy land if you're not a Muslim. Ain't going to happen. Try to buy most anything. Good luck. Where Mecca is, you got the interstate, buy Mecca, 
It has exits, exit ramps there. It says, if you're not a Muslim, do not exit. Keep driving. <clears throat> it's in several languages there also. Daniel 11, verses 41 through 43, they'll also enter the beautiful land. That's Jerusalem, by the way, Israel. Many countries will fall, but these will be rescued out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the foremost sons of Ammon. They're rescued by converting to Islam, by the way, which they did. Then he'll stretch out his hand against other countries. The land of Egypt will not escape. What's the religion of Egypt? Islam. But he'll gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And Libyans and Ethiopians will follow at his heels. Uh, Ethiopia is not an Islamic country. It has a, a, a large... Islamic population or good size, but Ethiopia in that day is not ge ge geographically the same land as it is today. Ethiopia t in that day is the country of Sudan. That's a pretty strong Muslim country. <clears throat> Going back to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they do not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So he'll have the deception of wickedness. The deception of wickedness. Daniel 7 verse 8 says, While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. Daniel 11, verse 21. And in his place, a despicable person will arise on whom the honor of kingship has not been conferred. By the way, starting with Daniel 11, or, uh, verse 21, he goes into a biography of Muhammad. And it's a very detailed description of the life of Muhammad. Then it morphs into Islam as a whole after the death of Muhammad. In his place, a despicable person will arise on whom the honor of kingship has not been conferred. Uh, Muhammad was a king of which area? He wasn't a king. He was never a king. He just came in and conquered with the sword. But he will come in a time of tranquility and seize the kingdom by intrigue. Ooh, Paul wrote this, the deception of wickedness. Yeah, okay, that's a good way to put it. Going back to 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 and 12. For this reason, Elohim will send upon them a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Elohim will send a deluding influence on Islam so, they, so that they might believe what is false. Interesting. So who's causing all this? Elohim is. He's causing all this. That's what Paul said, and he's right. You know why? Because Elohim wants these people judged. He wants them judged. <coughs> In Daniel 12, verses 9 and 10, And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. <clears throat> uh, Paul also wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, And if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the Elohim of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Messiah, who is the image of Elohim. You know, and I've heard so many people say, well, the God of this world, that, that's Satan. No, Satan's not an Elohim. Satan is not an Elohim. He's never called one. He's called a prince in some areas. Uh, but those princes are also the restraining forces of entire nations. Those are princes. They're spiritual entities. But never an Elohim. No. That, that uh, Greek word is theos. In whose case, the theos of this world is the same word right, used right there as theos. Who, the glory of Messiah who is in the image of theos. 
That's the same word, and there's no capitalization in the Greek, only in translations, where Christians want to influence you. So we make this one a little G God. That one is a big G God. <clears throat> Verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians 2. But we should always give thanks to Elohim for you, uh, brethren, beloved by the Master, because Elohim has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faithfulness in the truth. Elohim has chosen his people from the beginning for salvation through sanctification. What's sanctification again? To be made set apart. It's a process. It's a process. By the breath and faithfulness in the truth. Verses 14 and 15. For it was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our master Yeshua Messiah. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to, to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. <clears throat> Paul wants them to stand firm in their traditions which they were taught. Now that tradition, interesting word. We think uh, Torah good, traditions bad. Well, okay, we got a room full of Gentiles, let's say, and someone comes in and says, uh, honor the Sabbath day, don't eat unclean things, honor the appointed times, stay away from paganism. What are the Gentiles going to look at those as? Those are Ju Jewish traditions. Yeah. And he doesn't care what you call them. He doesn't care what you call them. Uh, why, didn't, why didn't Paul just say, well... I want you to uh, open up your, your Gideon's Bibles I dropped off, okay, and go to Deuteronomy. And, yeah, no, no, no. He has some stuff he could teach them, all right? And I'm sure they took notes. He left information there. But uh, information, yeah, they all, when Paul would talk they, uh, and teach, what they would do, they'd get their cell phones out and put it on record. So they didn't miss a word, right? <clears throat> so, yeah, to them, he used the word traditions. That's probably the way they referred to them. It's not that big of a deal. And even Christians say the Jewish traditionary law is what that uh, paradisus, which um, being used here would just mean the Torah, another way of saying it. A way of expressing it to Gentiles. Verses 16 and 17 of 2 Thessalonians 2. Now, now may our Master Yeshua Messiah himself and Elohim our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. It is the Spirit of the Father that strengthens us in every good work and word. Chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Master may spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you. <clears throat> he wants him to pray that the word of the Father be spread and glorified. The way Elohim is glorified is by his people being obedient to his word. That's how the Father is glorified. If you want to glorify the Father, obey his Torah. Isaiah 60, verse 21 reads, And all your people will be righteous. They'll possess the land forever. The branch of my planting the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. John 15, verse 8. But this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. What does that mean, bear much fruit? Good works. And so prove to be my disciples. Verse 2 of 2 Thessalonians 3. That we, we may be delivered from perverse and evil men, for not all have faithfulness. So he wants them to pray that he and others be delivered from evil and perverse men because not all men have faithfulness. Paul even gets that phrase from the Torah. In Deuteronomy 32, verses 19 and 20, And Yahweh saw this and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and daughters. And he said, I'll hide my face from them. I'll see, I'll see what their end shall be. For they are a perverse generation, sons in whom is no faithfulness. 
Verse 3 of chapter 3. But Adonai is faithful. He'll strengthen and protect you from the evil one. <clears throat> um, the one is not there. It's, it's italicized. It was added. He'll protect, you, protect us from evil. He's quoting the Psalms here. Psalm 121, verse 7, Yahweh will protect you from all evil. He'll keep your soul. He'll keep your life. Verse 4, chapter 3, And we have confidence in Adonai concerning you, that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. <clears throat> Paul has confidence in them. They're going to continue in keeping the Torah of the Father. Psalm 78, verse 7 says that they should put their confidence in Elohim and not forget the works of Elohim, but keep his commandments. Um, what's another word for confidence? I used it earlier, but what's another word for confidence? They should keep their confidence in Elohim. Faith. Faith. They should keep their faith in Elohim and not forget the works of Elohim, but keep his commandments. See, even if you want to go down to that word that really just means confidence, it still means keep the commandments. <clears throat> Verse 5 of chapter 3, that the master, and may the master direct your hearts in the love of Elohim and in the steadfastness of Messiah. Paul prays that Elohim direct their hearts into the love of Elohim. <clears throat> In Psalm 119, verse 36, the psalmist writes, Incline my heart to your testimonies, and not to dishonest gain. 1 Kings 8, verse 58, that we may incline our hearts to himself, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances, which, we, which he commanded our fathers. So if your heart is inclined toward the Father, you're obedient to his Torah. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. This is the new covenant, by the way. Moreover, Yahweh your Elohim will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, in order that you may live. Chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of Master Yeshua Messiah, that you keep aloof from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. Well, um, Paul commands them, stay away from those who lead an unruly life that not according to the Torah. The Greek word for tradition is paradisos, once again. Um, in this particular case, it's definitely referring to, well, the Jewish way of life, the Torah. <clears throat> Verse 7 of chapter 3, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. He said, follow my example. Do what I did in following the Torah. <clears throat> He's saying this also because uh, don't act in an undisciplined manner among you. Apparently some people were sponging off the assembly. Verses 8 through 10. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working day and night so that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we don't have a right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model to you that you might follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone will not work, neither let him eat. Well, Paul is talking about, he's, he's against the lazy sluggard. And he does not want them to be taken advantage of. Don't let them take advantage, even if it means they don't eat. Um, you know, if you got your, you got your kids not going to eat dinner, uh, send them to bed without dinner, set it out in front, of, in front of your kid for breakfast. If they don't eat it then, set it out in front of them for lunch. What's going to happen eventually? They're going to eat it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're going to get sick when they eat it. But, <laughs> but we'll learn, did we learn a lesson here? <laughs> what? 
You're just not hungry. That's right. Yep. <clears throat> well, he gets this from the Tanakh about the sluggard. Proverbs 13, verse 4. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. But the soul, the soul of the diligent is made fat. Proverbs 24, verses 30 through 34. I pass by the field of the sluggard and by the vineyard of the man lacking sense. And behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles. Its surface was covered with metals. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then your poverty will come on as a robber and your want like an armed man. Hmm. I don't read the sympathy. I don't see it. Verses 11 and 12 of chapter 3. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Master Yeshua Messiah to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Paul wants everyone to provide for themselves and we don't need strife. We don't need strife. That's what, um, <clears throat> that's what he's commanding against. No strife. I'm glad this assembly, been here 15 years now, has not had strife. Is that right, Mark? <laughs> 15 years, August 1st. Been in this building. Uh, Proverbs 17, 1 says, Better is a dry morsel with quietness with it than a house full of feasting with strife. Isn't that the truth? <clears throat> Chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. And if anyone does not obey our instruction of this letter, take special note of that man and do not associate with him so that he may be put to shame. <clears throat> um, Ones that are intentionally disobedient to the Torah of the Father are to be ashamed. Ezra 9, verse 6, we read, And I said, O my Elohim, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to you, my Elohim, for our iniquities have risen above our heads, and our guilt has grown even to the heavens. Jeremiah 6, verses 15 and 16, Were they ashamed because of the abomination they've done? They were not even ashamed at all. They did not even know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be cast down, says Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths, where the good way is, and walk in it. And you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Paul wants, the reason he wants them to be ashamed because shame can lead to repentance. That's what he wants. Jeremiah 31, verses 18 through 20. I have surely heard Ephraim grieving. You've chastised me, and I was chastised. Like an untrained calf, bring me back that I may be restored, for you are Yahweh my Elohim. For after I turned back, I repented. After I was instructed, I smote on my thigh. I was ashamed and also humiliated because I bore the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a delightful child? Indeed, as often as I've spoken against him, I certainly still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, declares Yahweh. Ezekiel 16, verses 61 through 63. Then you'll remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sisters, both your older and your younger. And I'll give them to you as daughters, but not because of your covenant. Thus I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am Yahweh, in order that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth any more because of your humiliation, when I have forgiven you for all that you have done. Adonai Yahweh declares. Let's look at one more here in Ezekiel 36, verses 31 and 32. Then you'll remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. You will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I'm not doing this for your sake, declares Adonai Yahweh. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. That's why he wants him to feel shame. 
So they turn away from their evil ways. In the father's eyes, being ashamed and turning back to his Torah is the dead coming back to life. That's how he sees it. In Luke 15, starting at verse 18, we read, I will get up and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. What, what is this? What are we reading? What is this? No? It's a parable. Which one? Starts with a P. Product, product, prodigal, prodigal. Do I hear it? Son! There we go. Prodigal son. Verse 19, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. He's ashamed of himself. And he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven in your, in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For the son of mine was dead and he's come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to be merry. I don't know how long it's been since we did Luke, but. That's about the two houses of Israel. That's right. That's about Ephraim and Judah. And this is Ephraim that squandered the Torah right away and just left. But we'll go over that sometime in the near future. Again, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 15. And yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. <clears throat> If they're disobedient to the Torah and they're ashamed, they should be admonished and treated as a brother. That's how it's supposed to be done. According to the Torah, Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18, you shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart, but you shall surely reprove your neighbor, but shall not incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. Chapter 3, verse 16. Now may the, Elo the uh, Adonai of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The master be with you all. Uh, Elohim blesses his people with peace, with shalom. Psalm 29, verse 11. Yahweh will give strength to his people. Yahweh will bless his people with shalom. Righteousness and peace, by the way, they go hand in hand. Righteousness and peace do. Psalm 85, verses 8 through 10. I will hear what Elohim, Yahweh, will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, the glory that glory may dwell in our land. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. <clears throat> Verse, verse 17, 2 Thessalonians 3, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. Uh, Paul writes this letter with his own hand. It probably had his signature on it. He did not want them to be fooled by somebody who's pretending to be him. So he tells them this. <clears throat> in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, Verse 2, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 2, because he was saying here that you may not quickly be shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us. So he's giving them a signature on this so they know it's from him. Verse 18, the grace of our master Yeshua, Messiah, be with you all. He wants the grace, the loving kindness of Elohim to be with them because they keep his commandments. Exodus 20, verse 6. But showing loving kindness or grace to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And Deuteronomy 12, verses, or 7, verses 9 through 12. Know therefore that Yahweh your Elohim, he is Elohim, the faithful Elohim, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. But he repays those who hate him to their faces to destroy them. 
He will not delay with him who hates him. He'll repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandment and the statutes and the judgments, which I'm commanding you today, to do them. Then it shall come about, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that Yahweh your Elohim will keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness, which he swore to your forefathers. <clears throat> that is Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. Any thoughts, any questions? What are your questions? Well, was it clear? Does everyone see that he gets what he was doing was teaching them the book of Daniel? Was that clear to everybody? <clears throat> uh, this is why you can't, you can't take Paul's letters, especially on prophecy. When he talks about prophecy, and he does at times, you can't take that and say, there, that's the prophecy. You need to see where he got it from and put it all together. Because some of these things already happened. Many have, yeah. Would you say that this, maybe this is one of the stronger assemblies? Because, yes, because probably they were because they were faithful. <clears throat> and because the, the questions were, were sort of technicalities, so to speak. Yes. They were concerned about they'd already missed, you know, he said, no, no, don't be confused about that or apprehend. So to me, he was not dealing so much with un, uh, pagan stuff and a lot of this, the, but, but educating them more and clearing up some misconceptions. Yes, clearing up some misconceptions and educating them more. Not like the letters to the Corinthians. The Corinthians, they were a basket case. Good grief, one guy was having sex with his mother. They had a question, can we still have sex with temple prostitutes or not? Because I see a loophole in the Torah. And he answered, answered that. There's all kinds of things that they, uh, that was just a, that was just a, a dumpster fire in Corinth, yeah. And he was good to point out in his letter how he was proud of them and good reports that he'd get from them that pleased right. him and yep. continued to encourage them. Yeah, continue to encourage them that yeah, we all need that. We all need encouragement. That's why we meet. That's why he wants us to get together every week. So we can encourage and uplift one another. <clears throat> it's not, there's no, there's no Sabbath sheriff here. We had one. He's gone. It was years ago. <clears throat> so we, we don't take notes on everyone's misgivings. Okay, let's uh, pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, for this time that we've had together to study your word and we we pray father that through our lives that you are glorified and may Yahweh bless us and keep us may Yahweh make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us and may Yahweh lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace amen <clears throat>